Okay, I'll just go ahead and hit the go live button, I think. So all right. Clicking that. And it says we're live. And there you go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone across the Zoom Dome and around the world. You're welcome to the December 2022 edition of the African Literature Association Lecture Series. My name is Aki Adeshokan. I teach comparative literature and African cinema at Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana. And it's been my pleasure over the past two years to coordinate this series with my colleagues in the Executive Council of the Association, especially Matthew Brown of the University of Wisconsin in Madison and James Makoko of William and Hubbard College in Geneva, New York. The series began two years ago at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, forcing a global lockdown. But it was also an initiative suggested by the president of the association at the time, Grima Negash of Ohio State University, and it has continued to receive the support of the Executive Council, particularly of subsequent presidents, Mohamed Kamara of Washington and Lee University, and Gaurav Desai of the University of Michigan, who is our current president and a co-organizer of the series. We also acknowledge the technical support of Dan Lennington, who is our development, web development assistant. In the main, the African Literature Association uses this lecture series to engage the uh, intellectual and professional attention of the members outside of the conference calendar. And it has had the benefit of opening literary studies up to other areas of study of artistic expression, moving on to those fields in the humanities and in the social sciences invested in the generation of knowledge in all spheres of life. We're getting there. And those in attendance who may be new to the series are encouraged to review past lectures dating back to September 2022, 2020, excuse me, to get a sense of the diversity of subjects and scholars that we've already featured. As always, we acknowledge the continuing support of other members of the council, as well as the larger membership of the association. Due to your continuing attention and attendance, the series has come to stand in the past year, past two years, as a matter of fact, as a publicly engaged feature of the association's presence in this age, in this age when to be publicly engaged is, re, is roughly equivalent to be socially and civically responsive. Thank you, everyone. Today, we host a panel of speakers, scholars of African literatures whose professional range covers the broad topic that our title addresses as a question. What does racial otherness mean in African literature? When the news of the award of the Nobel Prize in Literature to Abdul Razak Gruna broke in October 2021, an African writer welcomed the announcement with a tweet that read, in part, may it, that is the announcement, the award, shift the world's understanding of African literatures away from hegemonic ethnopatriarchy. That phrase, hegemonic patriarchy, was emphasized in the tweet. Acknowledged or not, there is a perception in among African literature scholars that writers and communities, writers or communities viewed as belonging to Africa's racial orders are frequently marginalized. There are many historical antecedents in the political realm as well, especially in East Africa, places like Uganda. It is conceivable that the perception is stronger in social relations than in professional circles, although the difference between both is not consequential. Yet, there are many established scholars whose focus, whose work focused almost exclusively on such communities, writers, or groups, as well as artists who have produced works from their experiences. Inspired by African Literary Association President Garab Desai's uh, address at the end of the 2022 annual conference, the panel features scholars of African literature with research interest in Indian oceanic migration, literary and political culture, white Africans, and other ethnic categories often seen through the prism of race. Three of those scholars have graciously agreed to join us to address this question within the parameters of their scholarship. I do want to emphasize the fact that they have been gracious in accepting, and I would like to personally thank them for the gesture. They are Ninka Boa, who is a lecturer in world literatures in English at the University of Sydney, Grant Farad, Professor of English and Africana Studies at Cornell University, and Emma Memo Tahari, Associate Professor of English at Duke University. They will speak in order. 
in which I've introduced and uh, named them, and I will introduce them in turn. I'll start with Professor Boer, who has published articles in MNL, Research in African Literatures, Journal of Commonwealth Literature and Comparative Literature Studies. Her book, The Brining South, Displacement and Sentiment in the Indian Ocean World, is coming, forthcoming in April 2023 from Duke University Press. The title of our presentation is South African Literature as Indian Ocean Literature, Histories as, as, and Case Studies. You're welcome to unmute your audio and turn on your video, Ninka. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and good, good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening, good night here. I'm in Singapore at the moment where it's uh, just gone midnight. So my apologies if I'm not always entirely coherent. Um, I just want to thank uh, Akin, Gaurav, Matt, Dan, and everyone else behind the scenes for organizing this. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, just going to share my screen. Um, and play this, great. Um, a few years ago, I did a short talk at the American Comparative Literature Association's annual conference on the possibilities of turning to an oceanic perspective for African literary studies. Today's talk is a more focused follow-up to that one in which I argue for the value of oceanic connections for the study of South African literature with implications for other Indian Ocean literatures more broadly. South African literature has been so heavily impacted by and is often only studied through the lens of apartheid, which means that the racial categories imposed by the apartheid regime continue to dominate discussions of South African literature. Introducing an Indian Ocean lens allows for a perspective which does not sidestep the impact of apartheid, but which nuances our readings of literature and allows for new categories and comparisons. So in this talk, I will examine two South African novels from an Indian Ocean perspective, and that's Ansuya R. Singh's Behold the Earth Mourns from 1960, and Yvette Christiansen's Unconfessed from 2006, showing in both cases how an Indian Ocean reading opens new angles of approach. Throughout my talk, I argue for what I call a briny South approach which combines the historical breadth and environmental focus of ocean studies with the political and ethical drive towards understanding the subaltern experience of globalization that marks global South studies. So what do I mean by a briny South approach? Melding the strengths of ocean studies and global South studies, the briny South describes approaches to analyzing texts produced in the wake of ocean-borne oppression that are attentive to both the materiality of the oceanic encounter and subaltern solidarities formed as a result. The Briny South then can be defined as the study of transoceanic networks of subaltern connection. Oceans are spaces of subalternity or rather subalternization, peripheral to continental area studies and national linguistic uh, comparative studies, oceans are also spaces of labor, of uneven power relations, of involuntary displacement, of violent encounters, death and disappearance. But the ocean has also produced new identities and solidarities in response to these processes of subalternization, some of which I describe in this talk. The framework of the Briny South allows us to see the ocean as a transnational space that produces both subalternity and solidarity. So while I may have coined this term, uh, the approach itself is not new, and several existing studies already exemplify the potential of the Briny South as an umbrella term for a body of work. Any work that engages with the centrality of the ocean to historical forces of domination and subjection such as slavery, colonialism, indenture, convict deportation, and warfare, already engages with this project. And Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic is, of course, an early example. Three recent critical approaches are particularly apt for examining the networks which make up the Briny South. Uh, Isabel Hofmer's uh, Hydrocolonialism, Ashley L. Cohen's Global Indies, and Meg Samuelson and Sharnay Laverie's Oceanic South. Uh, 
These three projects illustrate some of the strengths of the Briny South approach, historical engagement, subaltern solidarities, and the potential to expand the area of focus beyond the human, to encompass non-human animal empathies, and even more radically, the oceanic environment itself. I'll begin by applying this approach to Ansoya R. Singh's 1960 novel, Behold the Earth Mourns. While not terribly well known, this novel is usually invoked as the first novel by a South African Indian author. Singh's novel, which can be seen as inaugurating South African Indian fictional writing, is also unique in that under apartheid, subsequent South African Indian authors turn to the short story rather than the novel, as vehicle for expressing what Pallavi Rastogi calls the contradictory impulses of collectivity versus specificity, which animate the South African Indian community under apartheid. These short stories appear after 1975, and it's only in the 1990s with the democratization of South African society that South African Indian writers return to the novel. In examining Behold the Earth Mourns as a novel which fails to inspire a tradition of anti-apartheid South African Indian novel writing, I attempt to complement Rastogi's analysis by examining how the novel predicts or stages its own failure as a literary progenitor. So what can we discern about this text by asking about trans-oceanic subaltern solidarities? What one notices is the erasure of the history of indenture. And here I specifically mean indenture as the transportation of South Asian laborers under contracts to work for a specific, specific period of time uh, to South Africa, this uh, British uh, colony of Natal, after which they could re-indenture themselves, return to British India, or stay in South Africa, particularly Natal. And this is just a, a little map showing uh, some of the, the, the places of origin. Uh, where these indentured neighbor, uh, laborers who went to Natal came from. So Singh's novel begins by introducing the Nirvani family, focalized on Krishna Dit Nirvani. His children were the third generation of settlers in this southern land of sunshine and adventure. His father, Nirvani, had come out as a virile young trader accompanied by an inexperienced wife. In the years of their life together, she could have been strengthened by adversity, success, and excitement. The trials and heartaches they, faced with, they were faced with in a new country, undeveloped, raw, and unbuilt. By explicitly identifying her characters as, settl as settlers, and in her description, both of the landscape and the people settling it, Singh conforms to much of typical colonial writing. South Africa is described as this southern land of sunshine and adventure, a new country, undeveloped, raw, and unbuilt. The new settlers are heroic, bravely confronting trials, heartaches. Uh, even the architecture of the house Nirvani builds is recognizably colonial. I quote again, several porticos and verandas supported by thick white columns surrounded the inner rambling house while the garden consisted of carpet-like lawns, orchards of mango, figs, and citrus grove. There is no indication of who performed the labor to establish these orchards or acknowledgement that mangoes were not originally indigenous to South Africa. The obfuscation of the question of who works the land is of course central to traditional settler writing. Um, in Singh's description and her novel in general, no mention is made of any labor taking place on the sugarcane farm owned by the Nirvanis at all. Both black labor and crucially indentured South Asian labor uh, are effaced. This choice by Singh is understandable. And here I'll just briefly uh, fast forward through a section showing how the influential apartheid thinker, sociologist Jeffrey Cornier, constructed the image of the South African Indian as a racial group that is alien and will re remain alien. Cornier seems unaware of the irony of arguing for the repatriation of South African Indians because they're not indigenous to South Africa, while at the same time taking for granted the position of white South Africans within South Africa. In this, in this text, he doesn't acknowledge the fact that whites do not have the same claim to indigeneity as the so-called natives or coloreds are accorded uh, in one of these passages. Um, and this is from a text called um, Africa Sonde the Asiat, or Africa Without the Asiatic. 
Um, and in this text we read, um, as concerns the white race, the contribution of the Indian comes down to slowly but surely uprooting a him. This must be prevented. When the white race relinquishes its intimate bond with the earth of the fatherland, it will surely and definitely be one of the causes leading to his downfall in this country. And this passage clearly reveals Cornea's anxieties. While ostensibly he is simply talking about South African Indians becoming successful farmers in South Africa at this point, his language returns to the image of Indians as a force that will slowly but surely creep or slip in and force Afrikaners to release their hold on the land. The intimate bond with the earth or soil, so central, central to the Afrikaner myth of belonging, is revealed to be reversible. One can be de-earthed. One's claim to the, on the land lost to the alien, implicitly revealed here as fellow alien, South, Af South Asian settler. So tellingly, Cronier focuses his argument on indentured Indians and their descendants, asking whether there was a need to use indentured laborers in the first place. His model for South Asians in South Africa is the indenture contract, a brief legally controlled interlude after which uh, she or he is supposed to return to British India. So in Behold the Earth Mourn, Singh thus deliberately tells a different story about the origins of South Asians in South Africa, emphasizing that her protagonists are the descendants not of indentured laborers, but of traders who built their own shops and developed their own land. Initially, it seems like Singh's text wants to frame itself within the chronotope of the traditional settler novel, which is one of genealogical or dynastic descent one generation succeeding the other and inheriting the land. This chronotope of genealogical descent in the traditional sense is denied to Singh's characters, however, by the imposition of apartheid's le legislature, which tears the family from their home and disrupts the imagined endless time of generation succeeding generation into the future. Thus the dynastic chronotope is abandoned, but Singh stakes a different kind of filiative claim towards the end of the novel. The Indian-born protagonist Yageswari returns to her house following a jail term for entering South Africa against apartheid laws and sees her daughter Malini in the arms of her black nanny, Anna. Uh, re reluctantly, Malini went to her mother, almost sensing estrangeness. Yagasvari had neither the strength of emotion nor the energy of the body to receive the dearest creature of her heart. She smiled in half thankfulness that there was an attachment, that there should be Anna for her little one. At this moment, it was all she could convey to Anna and she understood it. Anna took her new child and went into the house, hiding from her the thoughts that passed deep in her mind. The novel ends shortly afterwards with the death of Yagasvari, leaving open the suggestion that the future of the family lies in this adoption of Malini by her African nurse, who recedes enigmatically, hiding her thoughts. This is a strange end to the novel dedicated to South Africa on the centenary of the arrival of the Indians in the country. Is Singh implying that South Africa should be abandoned given up on as a home for South African Indians? Or is she hinting at the possibility of a new kind of voluntary affiliation or even filiation between black and Indian? Crossing racial boundaries that had seemed inviolable, this end traces a dramatic divergence from both the genealogical association with the soil and the language of law and possession that is operative in both Singh and Konya's texts. Another section of the novel suggests a possible reason for this divergence. Yagiswari, soon upon her initial arrival in South Africa, attempts to have a conversation with Anna while sketching her portrait. Oh, Anna, I feel sad. Can I come and see your home? You have to get a paper to come to the farm. The land does not belong to us. Then who does it belong to? That is a long story, Yagiswari. Why did your hu husband leave you, Anna? This place grow big, big like this. Keep your hands down, please, Anna. I show you all right. More chimneys come, more smoke, and more husbands sleep wives. But why did he leave you behind? He can't bring me. He find another woman. Yagasvari was exasperated. She could not understand. Well, she would try another time and went on with her drawing. In both these last passages, Anna remains opaque. She hides the thoughts that pass deep in her mind and here refuses to explain herself clearly to Yagasvari. In her article, Every Secret Thing, Racial Politics in Ansuya R. Singh's Behold the Earth Mourns, 
Antoinette Burton describes this scene by saying that Yagasvari clearly doesn't know about, let alone understand, the township system or the pass laws. While she is right in describing Yagasvari's inability to understand Anna here, I would like to add that the system of which she which Anna is, uh, Yagasvari is completely ignorant is not just the pass laws or the township system, but the system of migrant labor in force in South Africa at the time. Starting in the 1870s, African men were recruited to work primarily in mining compounds, but later also in factories on short-term contracts. Crucially, they could not bring their families with them and lived in large compounds in hostels close to their place of work. Between contracts, they would return to their families who usually lived in so-called native reserves. The migrant labor system was incredibly disruptive to the family lives of the migrant laborers. The question that Yagasvari doesn't understand why Anna's husband left her is as a reference to the fact that he was most likely one of these migrant laborers. He can't bring me, Anna says. Notice also that the farm does not belong to Anna's family either. The same fate that assails the Nirvani family at the beginning of the novel, the loss of the farm, has happened to Anna's a generation earlier. But this exchange also hints at something Singh seems to disavow in her novel. The parallels between internal migrant labor in South Africa and the system of indentured labor that brought so many South Asians to South Africa. While at first glance, this conversation between Anna and Yagasvari seems patronizing, both in its content, but also in the broken English thing ascribes to Anna, there's more at stake here. If indentured labor is written out of Singh's narrative, these covert references to migrant labor and the fact that Yagasvari hands over Malini to Anna at the end of the novel may be a way to read indenture back into the novel. The filial connection Yagasvari makes with Anna by having her adopt her child could also be an acknowledgement of this alternative history of Indians in South Africa. This returns us to the question of Singh's novel as a literary progenitor. While the system of apartheid resulted in a rich body of resistance literature by black South Africans, the relative paucity of South African Indian fiction in this canon is often commented on. Singh's novel in its with its ambiguous ending signals its own failure as a model or progenitor of a literary tradition. While this novel could have served as the origin for a tradition of South African Indian novel writing under apartheid, by partly drawing on the settler novel mode, as well as the white liberal mode associated with Alan Payton's cry, The Beloved Country, Singh's novel does not inaugurate a new tradition, but rather self-consciously stages the failure of this particular sentimental form. A briny South approach to this novel does suggest alternative ways of reading it by drawing attention to the shared experience of coerced displacement and precarity shared by indentured laborers and South African migrant workers. The novel can be read perhaps as not signaling the impossibility of South African Indian apartheid novels, but opening the door to a shared non-racial literature of subaltern resistance and solidarity. Turning to Yvette Christiansen's Unconfessed allows me to demonstrate the value of an oceanic approach to a more contemporary novel. In this case, the historical form of ocean-born oppression is enslavement, and specifically the transportation of, of enslaved persons from their Indian out, ocean outposts by the Dutch um, VOC. In my book, I examine the legal records produced by the VOC and their British successors to argue that if the Anglophone Black Atlantic is a sphere of autobiographical speech and legal silence, the Indian Ocean world of enslavement can be seen of one of, as one of autobiographical silence, but legal speech. The rich heteroglossia of the Indian Ocean legal records stand in contrast to portrayals of the Atlantic Ocean slave trade as a process of silencing and erasure. Apartheid South African novelist, for example, discovered in the legal archives of the 18th and 19th century Cape, rich sources for crafting their fictional imaginaries of slavery. Andre Brink, for example, used legal and other records from the colonial Cape colony to write thinly veiled allegories for contemporaneous injustices. One of his novels, translated as A Chain of Voices, was originally published in Afrikaans as Haute Den Back in, 18, in 1982 is based on British court records following an 1825 slave uprising led, led by an enslaved man, Halant. The Afrikaans title refers to the name of the farm where Halant lived, which literally translates as shut your mouth. 
And the novel is transtructured as a sequence of different first person narrations telling the story of this uprising, thereby imaginatively refusing this injunction to keep quiet. The novel acts as a critique of the contemporaneous Africana ruling party and its segregationist policies, as the concluding sentence in the voice of Haaland makes clear. The eggs of the lightning bird remain in the earth for a long, long time, but one day they'll hatch and bring the fire back over these mountains without beginning or end, where my footprint remains forever proudly trodden in the stone. I'm going down now. In a way, I suppose I'm burnt out, but the fire, the fire remains. Slavery thus became a way to read the present into the past, mapping the racial injustices of the 1980s onto the historical figures of the enslaved, but in the process, replicating apartheid racial distinctions, distinctions and simplifying the historical experience of slavery in South Africa. First apartheid novelists in South Africa have also drawn upon the rich archives of enslavement from the region to reimagine larger oceanic worlds, moving beyond the binaries composed by apartheid era protest writing. One of these post-apartheid novels, Yvette Christians' Unconfessed from 2006, is based on the trial for infanticide of an enslaved woman, Sila van den Kaap, at the Cape in 1823. So the novel describes the farm where the protagonist grew up, in 1806. There was Philip from Malabar. Philip spoke a language that none of us understood. Amarant came from Batavia. She worked in the house. Perhaps it was because they had no one else from their lands that she and Philip kept close together. Some days I would hear them talking, each in his or her own tongue, laughing. And then there were those of us who are called Mosbikers. We came in ships and never got that rolling world out of our ears because on some days, one of us would stumble and the others knew the ocean was sending us a message. Christian thus focuses on uniquely Indian Ocean circumstances of enslavement, where the enslaved came from diff various different VOC settlements and trading posts. In this case, Malabar in India, Batavia on the island of Java, and Mozambique. Uh, Indian Ocean enslavement regimes differed from that of the Atlantic Ocean in that the slave trade was multidirectional, forcing enslaved from Southeast Asia into South Asia and vice versa, while forcing enslaved from East Africa and Madagascar into South and Southeast Asia. From all these regions, the enslaved in turn also ended up in South Africa. Indian Ocean slavery thus expands our notion of enslavement away from the Atlantic understanding of modern slavery as inevitably involving individuals from sub-Saharan Africa, as the enslaved in the Indian Ocean were often not African in origin. The Cape of Good Hope, for example, served only as a destination, not a point of embarkation for enslaved from elsewhere in the Indian Ocean, South and Southeast Asia, East Africa and Madagascar. Philip and Amarant form a bond where their shared laughter transcends the different languages they speak. The OC court records showcase the multilingualism of the contemporaneous Cape society. The court of justice allowed witnesses to testify in their language of choice and the languages listed in the records include Bugis, Arabic, Chinese, Javanese, Malagasy, Portuguese, Malay, German, Dutch, and English. So although the records are all transcripts of the Dutch translations, names, exclamations, interjections, and phrases from almost all of these languages made it into the final recorded versions. Christian says Sila suggests that the shared experience of transportation across the Indian Ocean unites these individuals, regardless of their origins and languages, such that the afterlife of this oceanic journey viscerally haunts them. We never got that rolling world out of our ears. Oceanic displacement thus speaks a new language into their ears, and their stumbling communicates this message to others, a language, however, that could not be transcribed into the legal records of the Council of Justice. This passage speaks to both the realities of the multilingual slave society of, at the Cape, and also imagines forms of communication that go beyond the linguistic. So Briney's South approach here highlights the specificity of Indian Ocean enslavement as a system that both enriches and complicates Atlantic Ocean discussions of slavery. South African and specifically Cape Townian literature needs to be read with these specificities in mind. If anti-apartheid literature understandably was mired in the same right racial divisions that it was attempting to resist, we can now look to other approaches, other vistas and oceans, 
to enrich our understanding of both apartheid and post-apartheid literature. Um, and just to mention uh, this talk as uh, sort of a compilation of a uh, lot of different uh, kind of work that I was doing. So if you're interested in reading more about this, this is uh, um, some of my articles um, on this topic. And also just a little word of self-promotion. My book is coming out in April and I have a pre-order code, which means you can uh, get a discount on the book on the Duke University Press website. Um, thank you again so much, everyone, for, uh, for lending me uh, your time. Uh, All right, well, thanks so much. That was um, quite uh, informative and very nice uh, transition between uh, Singh and uh, Christiansi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ninka. Now we'll go to our next speaker. Uh, that's uh, uh, Grant Ferre, the author most recently of the Zelensky Method. And only black, uh, only a black athlete can save us now. His other works include an essay for Ezra, Racial Terror in America, which came out in 2021, and Martin Heidegger, Saved My Life, the University of Minnesota in 2015. He will speak on uh, what he calls Maghrebian love, focusing on Jacques Derrida and Albert Mami. Okay, uh, Grant, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, you can hear me, right? Um, good. Hello, folks. Um, thanks again for the introduction. So, this talk could as easily be titled um, The Mother's Love, or perhaps more appropriately, Love in One Language. Returning without returning, returning phantasmatically, not returning as such at all. Sorry, there's just some noise in the back. My apologies. Returning without returning, returning phantasmatically not returning as such at all, because there has been no leaving of which we can properly speak. The return, Derrida, the turn, the tour, the tarot or tower, the tour, turns and towers, these things of return, this cause of an eternal return, even in the mortality of a day, in the undeniable finitude of the ephemeral. So writes Jacques Derrida in Rhodes, two essays on reason. Return in death, an eternal return, even in the mortality of day. It is the past that haunts Derrida. It will not do to say that this is a past that he must confront. It is not that at all. Or if it is, as we shall see, it is a, confront, it is a confrontation that verges on something more akin to self-indictment. That is, if it is not a self-indictment as such. For now, however, let us propose it as a haunting, taken up in what we can call an order, an other mode of Derridian writing that is forcing itself into the forefront of his thinking. It is a ghostly presence that will not be still. What is named here at once provisionally and without hesitation as an other Derridian writing finds its fullest articulation in monolingualism of the other or the prosthetics of origin. It's an earlier, its earlier articulation is most often presumed to be circumfession Derrida's conversation, if that's the correct term, with Jeffrey Bennington. And there is good reason to accord that conversation, interview, public self-reflection, such a status. It is in circumfession that Derrida turns himself to the difficulty of making a new kind of philosophy, of doing philosophy otherwise. In circumfession, Derrida talks to us about how it is he came to be a self made by philosophy, a self that owes itself to philosophy and now seeks to recount that self-making to us. Derrida, in the spirit of his countrymen and philosophical predecessor, St. Augustine, taking us into his confidence and confessing himself to us, confessing to us in order to be thought, in order to be thought he must share his self-making with us. The formidable figure in the self-making is as is the case with Augustine's moniker, Derrida's mother, Georgette, or Esther, her sacred name, as he puts it. Derrida writes, and I quote, what these two women had in common is the fact that Santa Monica, the place in California near to which I am writing, also ended her days as my mother will, too, on the other side of the Mediterranean. Far from her land, in her case in the cemetery in Nice, 
which was profaned in 1984, end of quote. The death of the mother, the dislocation, the deracination of the mother, the mothers, mothers of Algerian philosophers born to die on the other side of the Mediterranean. Circumfession confirms the death of the mother, Georgette Esther, a mother that registers first in Derrida's herb as a gaping absence in that most inimitable, dare one say nearly unreadable of Derrida's works, Glass. The absent mother can now be confirmed dead. But the death of the mother does not mark by any means the death of the mother tongue, the death of the mother's tongue, the clearest and most perverse proof of which is the profaning of the mother's grave in Nice. In what language other than French could Georgette's grave have been profaned? Even in desecrating the mother's final resting place, the mother's tongue revealed its living after. The mother's tongue or the tongue made maternal by the mother speaking it survives. It survives as a profanity, the burden of the profane, an inheritance which cannot be forsworn, which Derrida names monolingualism. In that most famous of Derrida quotes from monolingualism, I have only one language, it is not mine. So, the, so writes the monolingual self from Paris, not for, far from where the profaning of the mother took place. There can be turn, no turning away that is not also a turning to, a returning to, the reinvocation of the language in which the mother is remembered. Jacques Derrida is haunted by the past. Derrida, as we have discerned by now, his haunting is of a very particular order. A critical effect of monolingualism is to show Derrida as a priori, already other to himself, as having always been other to himself. It is because of monolingualism that Derrida has been made other to himself. Derrida has been made other to himself by virtue not of his origin, but because of the prosthetic, because of the prosthetic origin that was appended to him. We could call that place Nice, the place where the Jewish mother is profaned in death, or it might be better to name that place Paris, the bastion of French life, where Derrida arrived after World War II and where he would live until his death in 2004. Regardless of the name it took, the not yet post-colonial France into which Derrida was absorbed, into which he was taken as to a mother's bosom, appended itself to him, made of the prosthetic a less visible artificiality or an artifice, we might say, and more of a limb phantasmatically renewed, reattached, and revitalized as though through a miracle of surgery. For all of the marvels of science, however, it was not only that the prosthetic dissolved all by itself. France, as it were, did not do all the work. Derrida contributed and contributed immensely to the visible dissolution of the prosthetic, the fading of the forces that sutured him into monolingualism. Those forces that made him monolingual and in so doing marked him at once as irrevocably French, the authoritative voice of deconstruction, a thinker whose very name was not only synonymous with French theory, but stood unquestionably as the name in the field and indisputably other. Other, if we need reminding, to both his adoptive France and his native Algeria. If it is the past that haunts Derrida, then we can name this haunting, which in Derrida can go by the name of either monolingualism or nostalgia, then we can say that it is a haunting already foretold in Maghrebian writing, in Maghrebian Jewish writing. Nostalgia is a condition that any thinking of a diaspora as Maghrebian in France should have anticipated. It pre presents a diff different order of difficulty to Derrida, but it is a difficulty that saturates the work of the Tunis Tunisian writer, Albert Memmi, from his first work, the novel, The Pillar of Salt, but much more so in his critical essay, The Colonizer and the Colonized. This is a question that preoccupies many, albeit in a language distinct from Derrida's. Memmi writes, and I quote, in the colonial context, bilingualism is necessary. It is a condition for all culture, all communication and progress. Possession of two languages is not merely a matter of having two tools, but actually means participation in two psychical and cultural realms, end of quote. 
than so many did. He lived in not two, but it could be see, said three cultural realms, his own Jewish community, his Arab neighbors, and by his own, his own account, the alienating world of French letters. And yet, as Memi is at pains to point out, the only thing that French colonialism gave him was precisely the thing that so troubled Derrida and Memi in a different register entirely. The gift, if you will, that French colonialism was made to many was the French language. If you hear a snoring in the background, I promise it's not me, but it's my dog whom I can't move. Apologies. Mm -hmm. The difference between Derrida and Memi is, of course, at once evident. Memi, who gives voice to the proximity between the colonized Jew and the colonized Arab in Tunis, a proximity where everyday tensions between the two communities sometimes manifested itself, as in the pillar of salt, where the Jewish kids are run off their turf by neighboring Arab kids. And in so doing, Memi alerts us to his own bilingualism. Born into a poor family, Memi spoke the language of the Medina, the Tunisian dialect of Arabic. In addition, of course, to the French he acquired via his formal education. Derrida, on the other hand, grew up in LBR, a middle-class Jewish neighborhood in the hills above Algiers. Derrida had no such facility in Arabic. The language of the Muslim majority came to Derrida symbiotically, perforating those lines of the streets, the spatial breaks between Arab and Jew, which divided Arab from Jew. Derrida remembers Arabs, um, this Arab infiltration, infiltration most vividly as the sound of the musen calling the faithful to prayer, as the sound of that other language that was not his own and over which he would stake no claim how that sound wafted into his neighborhood, first in Algiers and later in France. To be monolingual then is to be deracinated in not one, but two languages. It is if such a proposition might be entertained to be without language, even if Derrida would insist that it is not to be without a mother tongue. However, to be monolingual is to insist that linguistic facility or even demonstrable fluency being able to speak the language must not be mistaken for possession of the language. We cannot on this ground alone counterpose Derrida's monolingualism with Memi's bilingualism. How are we to name such a condition? Love, nothing other than love. For Memi, love many manifests itself in the form of death or open parentheses A, close parentheses A, a debt. The decision to write in the colonial language is, of course, a difficult one, presenting in advance of itself a number of challenges, demanding a relationship with the forces of colonialism that must at once and address, address and acknowledge it cannot be overcome, the facticity of oppression, exploitation, and violence. And yet the colonized, many insists, write, must write, lives with a compulsion to write. Memi is reflective, pained even, in his contemplations on this question. And I quote, as soon as they dare speak, what will they tell just those other people, other than of their malaise and revolt? Could words of peace or thoughts of gratitude be expected from those who have been suffering from a loan that compounds so much interest? For a loan which, besides, will never be anything but a loan. End of quote. The effect of Memi's economic analogy, made all the more resonant by its hard repetition, invocation of loan following invocation of loan is surprisingly to draw him close or closer, we might say, to Derrida. The failure to repay a loan will result in the acquisition of debt. To be the recipient of a loan is to be the recipient of the other's putative um, fiscal hospitality. To receive a loan is to establish the terms of an unequal relationship. Regardless of, not, or regardless of whether or not the loan is repaid, with interest, of course, the self will always know itself to have been in the other's debt. Is the writing of a debt, the inscribing of, the re of a relation into a contract, not a form of love? To love is to be made a recipient of that for which we possess insufficient capital, so that love before all else is a double investment. Love is how the present makes its own dependence on futurity, that moment in which the debt comes due, present to itself, as well as acting the present's investment in its own capacity to meet the demands of the future. Love, then, 
not as a hedge against the future, but as the present becoming even more present to itself. Love is not what is um, what is to come. Oh, sorry, say it again. Love is not what is to come, but that which will always be aware of how it is indebted to that which it has received. Receives. Love, however, not as that which can be taken for granted, but love as that which the other entrusts to our safekeeping, so that love is always on loan, that which asks to be held in trust. Love not as the coming to fruition of that which is not yet, but that which unceasingly over time accrues more of itself to itself. As always, however, on the premise of what is the promissory demands that love because of what Derrida might take as its infinitude cannot be possessed and it certainly cannot be owned. The most extreme form of possession, that is possession without a debt, which is to say ownership, and ownership records the impossibility of a relationship to the other, because it is what must be tended to as that which is temporarily, temp sorry, temporarily entrusted to those who are asked to hold it in safekeeping. Love is the raising out of the present that which is most deserving of preservation and growth, so that the only way to come into love is through indebtedness. It is this language that Derrida speaks, as he repeatedly tells us, this language that is not his. There would be nothing to do but conclude that love is indebtedness to that language that is not yours. Because of the way in which love demands address to the other, love makes it impossible to pronounce, to speak the language of possession, and so it is a priori, it, uh, so it a priori dispossesses the self of any proprietary claim to language. As such, in order to establish and maintain a monolingual relationship to language, which again is perforce a relationship to the other, it is necessary to, to declare that this language is not mine. It is not my own. Presented as the language of love, monolingualism stands for this reason in a non-dialectical relationship to bilingualism. It matters not whether a claim is staked to monolingualism, that is to say, a claim staked in the name of recognizing the impossibility and unsustainability of that claim, or bilingualism. If bilingualism is presented as a hierarchical proposition. French is the formal official language imbued with bureaucratic authority and the power of the imperial state, while the language of the Medina is the vernacular, the only language that has currency in everyday social and economic exchange amongst Arabs, Jews, and yes, even French official them. All language, regardless of its status, is on loan. All language refuses possession. All language must, as it were, be understood as a gift. That gift, that, that gift, the gift is that offering that breaks the cycle of exchange so that having been made a gift of, lang of the language, language is given to its speakers. We cannot claim ownership of the language so much as we need to understand that language has been entrusted to us, temporarily assigned to us, in order that we might care for it, might learn to care for it. We are thus always writing language from outside of language. Language is that which holds us at one remove. Neither that which we can write or that which we understand ourselves to be writing about is in any substantive sense by which we mean more properly, in a permanent sense, it is not ours. If language is not ours, then all writing is from outside. It bears as such an always removed distance relation to place. Language as such cannot be said to belong to a place, to any place, to a place. No language can be said to be of a place. Even if we make the unsustainable, perhaps the, even the spurious claim that such and such is a language of a place, we do so in a futile attempt to conflate the gift of language with our propensity for ownership. What the discourse of the loan makes evident is the impossibility of making language autochthonous. As such, autochthony speaks not only the politics of possession, but it inclines dangerously in the direction of an exclusive appropriation. That is, autochthony is shadowed by the logic of Blut und Grund, blood and soil. The language, language itself, all language, if it is of, that is, if it is native to, as such, those who inhabit, dare one say, one dare not say dwell, bowen, as Martin Heidegger prefers to render the term, 
those who inhabit their native soil stand in a proprietary relationship to their language, and this means that they can only write of their land. The proprietary turns on nothing so much as exclusion, because the self will not acknowledge the gift of language, because the self claims the land of the language for itself, it will not abide any writing that does not de it does not deem autochthonous. That is, that writing that is not imminently grounded in native soil. To make the claim of possession is then to invoke the discourse of interdiction. The discourse of interdiction works on the logic of prohibition. And it's precisely this relationship that the language that Derrida forswears. I have only one language. It is not mine. To write the language of love, to love language, to find love in language is to a priori denounce any attempt to claim language exclusively for the self. To write love in such a language that love can, that can bear love is to pose an existential threat to all calculative discourses. That is, by declaring it is not mine, even as the self struggles desperately to speak itself, to speak itself in a non-proprietary language, to argue against any form of speaking that counts. That is, it is not mine, allows us to see the constitutive failure that lurks at the heart of the numerator, of the numerate. That is, Derrida's monolingualism in all its ambivalent refusal reveals it as at the heart of the number that is bilingual, trilingual, and so on, is the unsustainability of the claim, a claim made all the more vacuous, perhaps we should say loveless, by and in its multiplicity. Monolingualism is as such that to which we must aspire. Determinedly non-proprietary, we are left to do the work of finding love, of giving love in a language not our own, but perhaps the mother's language, the mother tongue. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's uh, quite a quite a treat. Thank you very much. I uh, look forward to having questions with you about this, uh, and I hope uh, uh, comes from uh, from the um, uh, platform itself. So, well, thank you very much. It's quite uh, quite exciting and engaged. Thank you. Um, our third speaker is uh, Eman Memo Tahari, who is an expert on the fiction of Abdul Razak Gurna, and he will speak on Islam's new past and precarious, uh, excuse me, precarious present in the fiction of Abdul Razak Gurna. Uh, you're welcome, uh, Emad. Good morning, still, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? I yes. Would, I, thank you yes. very much. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to um, extend my gratitude to, to Akin, to Garav, and to Matthew, and also to my co-panelists, Nienke and Grant, uh, for, their, for their papers. I'm, I'm very humbled to have been asked to participate in this series. Um, the, uh, the paper that I'm going to read is um, the beginnings of my sort of exploring um, uh, Islam and the secular and the way those things uh, have been manifesting in contemporary, uh, modern and contemporary post-colonial fiction, uh, and specifically in the work of Abdul Razak Gurna. <clears throat> Salim, the narrator of Abdul Razak Gurna's 2017 novel, Gravel Heart, relates the following about his schooling in Zanzibar when he was a youth. I had made good progress with the Quran com compared to many other boys in my class. I had completed the Quran, reading the Quran twice from beginning to end to the satisfaction of my teacher who had listened to me read every single line of every page over the years correcting my pronunciation and making me repeat a verse until I could read it without stumbling. By the time I stopped attending Quran school, I could read the Quran fluently and with the appropriate intonation without understanding anything much of what I had read. I knew the stories. I love the stories. Salim stresses that he could not only read the Arabic language, but that he had learned to read it fluently Salim perfects the proper pronunciations of the words in the Quran 
illustrating the materiality and performativity of the profession of faith in Islam and the importance that is placed on the words themselves, their textures and sounds, all the way down to the enunciation of phonemes and the most spiritually generative way to intone, elongate, or shorten them. However, he also relates that he read the text again without understanding anything much of what he had read, except for the stories. Later in the narrative, Salim recalls a conversation he had had with his father about his grandfather, Ma'alim Yahya. Ma'alim Yahya was a deeply pious man who was never formally schooled, but who knew the Quran and the Hadith by heart. And he garnered the respect of nearly everybody in his immediate community and in Zanzibari society at large. But despite the esteem in which he was held, Salim relates that his grandfather represented, and I quote, the privileged remnants of another era. Salim's father then recounts that Ma'alim Yahya was given a token role in British colonial schools in Zanzibar, presumably to assuage the concern of locals that their children were going to be brainwashed, and I quote, turned into unbelievers by British education. Salim's father concludes his recollections on the matter by pointing out what he perceives to be a historical irony. And I quote, it is religious scholars like my father who made colonial education possible, end of quote. What these two textual moments from Gravel Heart events is what I believe to be one of the most potent, if furtive tensions that runs through much of Gurna's fiction. I'm speaking of the confluence of two large historical transformations. The first is the erosion or loss of and disengagement with the sacred, with religion as a self-evident truth, a process associated with secularization broadly. The second is the ways in which colonial modernity retasks religion and Islam specifically as an instrument of domination, the centerpiece of renamings and the reordering of knowledge regimes in colonial contexts, especially. Divested of its sacred and epistemological authority, Islam comes to do its work in historical time, engaged mainly with what Sayyid Hussein Nasr calls the this-worldly. Islam haunts, to use Charles Taylor's verb, the historical world, meaning that it is at once of and in the past and intensely present. While secular modernity has not necessarily decreased the number of faithful around the world, <clears throat> quite possibly the opposite, actually, Gurna's fiction demonstrates that in official status discourses, practices, and structures, its energies and legitimacy have been relocated. Gurna's fiction captures how religion is imbricated in colonial modernity's project of reorganizing African social life, not just regarding laws, land ownership, marriage, kinship structures, but also institutionalizing new taxonomies, categories, and criteria of belonging, of place, and what and who is and is not African. The shifts I am describing here are consequential for the way race is configured in the post-colonial moment, and the cultural labor that Gurna's fiction undertakes to describe these shifts. And so what Salim's father thinks is a historical irony that of Ma'alim Yahya teaching religion classes in British colonial schools is not an irony at all, but what Simon Gikandi points out is the very unparadoxical alignment between secular modernity and religion, again, especially in colonial contexts. This is another reason why the faulty but surprisingly enduring subtraction thesis of secularity, which is the notion that religion has simply been relegated from public life, proves especially imprecise and unedifying. Religion is not simply deleted from social and communal life in colonial, colonial contexts. Rather, its energies are transplanted to another arena of meaning-making and cultural authority. Paradise, the 1994 novel that arguably brought Gurna's widespread international plaudits, captured, captures these tensions and transformations through its main character, Yusuf, a youth who, like Salim of Gravel Heart, is alienated from Islamic doc doctrine 
Despite his divine virtues and his resemblances to his namesake, Yusuf of the Quran and Joseph from the Hebrew Bible. But Gurnaz Yusuf is principally and finally historical. He is exiled from the sacred and he is exiled <clears throat> or willingly flees rather from a past whose future would always be marked by the European horizon and the colonial and post-colonial condition. Yusuf is not an allegory, but it's impossibility because through and in him, Islam is embodied and lost, a victim and perpetrator of colonial oppression, a culture at once ancient and new, indigenous and alien. Paradise relates the ways in which the Arabic language, the profession of Islamic faith, as well as an explicitly articulated commitment to transnational or rather transcontinental commerce underpinned Muslim perceptions of self and other, perceptions that trafficked in ascriptions of civilization and bar barbarity. In the narrative, one member of the Muslim column that travels to the interior for trade draws a clear connection between trade and godliness even as other members of his trading column maintain that, and I quote, most of the occupants of heaven are poor. That's the end of the quote. There is a categorical, there is a categorical, sorry, a categorical correlation for Muslims in paradise between being Muslim and being civilized. And Muslims are portrayed as being contemptuous and exploitative toward other communities around them. But Gurna's narrative, while undissembling, in its critique of Muslim power, dominance, and human abuses in Eastern Africa, never characterizes it as un-African or non-African. In fact, the differences between Muslims and non-Muslims are perceived to be trivial in face of the imminence of European ascendancy, a notion that proves to be rather false. The historical chapter Paradise fictionalizes is presented as a portent for what was to come in the middle of the 20th century. In the 1960s, anti-colonial rhetoric in Eastern Africa and elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, including in many Muslim or predominantly Muslim societies pointed out and correctly that Islam was an assistive tool for French and British colonial domination of Africa from the late 18th century and onward, officially and historically. Officially because Muslims were quite literally assigned influential posts in colonial administrations, and historically, because Islamic societies established extractive economic networks that facilitated the European episodes of globalized capitalism. And, and this history is extensively commented upon in the work of, of Abu Lughod, Omar Sharif, and Chowdhury. Um, I, you know, there's an extensive archive and bibliographical uh, archive that, that documents those histories. These histories provided the rhetorical fuel for a convulsive rejection of Islam as alien and harmful to an original African essence that had to be recovered and restored. As Gurna himself stated in his Nobel accept acceptance speech, post-colonial independence produced, and I quote, a newer and simpler history, end of quote, that was responsive to the narratives of racial emancipation and progress. Um, just as a side, before I continue, um, <clears throat> As I'm recounting these um, perspectives, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't mean to, and I hope I do not appear to sound snide or invalidating of nationalism, uh, or at least the iterations of nationalisms that took hold in the 1960s. But to point out the collateral damage that those nationalisms did to other to other historical communities who who also thought of themselves as African. Uh, these narratives often intentionally and systematically conflated. Islam with Arab and therefore not African. This is a trope that is discernible, not just in Gurna's fiction, but one that is a salient uh, a theme in a lot of fiction produced in African literature in the decades after decolonization, as well as in a lot of theoretical discourse. Uh, famously, Chinuesu, uh, among others, spoke of Islam through the same prism. M.G. Vasanji's fictional output um, thematizes this development in places. Marisa Conde's fiction propagates it, as does Awi Kwai Armas. It even survives as a seemingly incidental plot point and character dialogue in contemporary novels by writers who are called Afropolitan writers, like Dinam Mengestu, in his beautiful things that heaven bears, wherein two friends in Washington, D.C., one Congolese and one Kenyan, 
casually assert that another peripheral character in the novel is not really African. He is from Mauritania. He is an Arab. This is strikingly odd because that same character is referred to as a black man by the white American characters in the narrative. The transformation of Islam into a sign of essential racial alterity manifested as official policy with real, real human tools, which is also uh, captured in Gurna's fiction, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of so-called Arabs and other so-called non-Africans were consequently marked for detention, deportation, or death throughout Eastern Africa. But I want to be clear that historically, not all of those who were targeted were Muslim. The dragnet included Hindus, Sikhs, and Christian communities too. But Islam and Muslim communities occupied a particular place in anti-colonial discourse, namely as a litmus test of Africanness, one that was used to sort out people in whom race or an ancestry could not be determined through other means. Revolution and independence meant, and I quote Salim again here, the mocking dismantling of our old stories by anti-colonial nationalists. Salim's dad remembers, in the 1960s and after, people had no choice, but as he put it, and I quote, to, to sit silently by while history was narrated anew, end of quote. The communities who lived through revolution, independence and nation building, processes and projects couched largely in secular and socialist national language were reminded, and I quote again, that they were Arab or Indian or Iranian, end of quote. The rebracketing of people along racial and ethnic lines according to a newly iterated Africanness is notable, but it is equally notable that Gurna's narrator refers to these transformations as stories. This points to the supreme importance, not of empirical truths, but of narratives to the ways in which human collectivities are shaped and the ways identities are claimed, imposed and withheld. Stories are homes and can make one homefold in the absence of a physical place, as Kenneth Wainaina said, but stories can also injure, evict and forget a people to history. Gurna's fiction demonstrates how these new social forms, new stories, in fact, nation, race, cast Islam's place in African history into contention in ways that, as Latin American scholar Walter Mignolo might put it, exceeds the mere exchange and conflict of different perspectives. Rather, these new, new social forms ushered in a new logic and new axioms of African history. Indigeneity became not only a clear what and a who, but a when. When was it? When was Eastern Africa indigenous? When was it disrupted, corrupted, colonized? This is why comparisons uh, between paradise and things fall apart, for example, yield limited insights. While those comparisons are not categorically false, or without merit, <clears throat> things fall apart in some ways does proceed from a sense of before and after, cause and consequence, and a sense for a discrete African historical community that was disrupted and remade by an external one. Paradise, on the other hand, resists origin stories and prefixes like pre and post. There is no pre-colony or pre-colonial in paradise. There is no recu recuperable Arcadian community and one of the ways paradise communicates this is through the ubiquity of gardens, an Islamic trope that often appear in dreams, also an Islamic trope, and which are otherwise largely walled off, dystopic and unavailable. In paradise, Eastern African society, while far from idyllic, was always and already many, multiple and mixed in ways that evaded modern geopolitical lines. The removal uh, of Islam from its position as the dominant, dominant spirit, uh, spiritual and social ontology and its repurposing as a sign for racial otherness does not stop in and with Eastern Africa. This is observable in, in Gurna's fiction that is set in England, where, where those characters and narrators have to come to terms with their exile and the chore of having to rebuild the life in a new and equally inhospitable society. 
Daoud, the main character of Gurna's 1988 novel, Pilgrim's Way, is a prime example of an individual who has to rene renegotiate new terrains of unbelonging while dealing with the ghosts of his past in Zanzibar. For Daoud, race and religion become entwined in ways that are both similar and dissimilar to his experience with independence in Eastern Africa. In Zanzibar, Islam indicated that Daoud was not black, not African, whereas in England, Islam accents Dawood's racial otherness as black and African. Dawood is described by the English as black and Muslim, the latter term emphasizing the peril and existential antagonism that the former term presents. It is not coincidental that while Dawood is taunted for his race throughout the narrative, he is given a beating by skinheads in the shadow of the Canterbury Cathedral. This figurative moment is conspicuous in the kind of work that it does, namely by demonstrating that religion and Islam in particular is a crucial component in the ways modern ideologies of race and nation operate. It is an oversimplification as Stathis Gorgoris warns to posit that secularization merely means Christianity's dominance disguised and continued um, in Western societies. But secularization does re-encrypt religion in relation to other social forces and categories like race and nationhood. And even as Talal Assad has argued in notions of citizenship and civic duty, universal human rights, as well as what is legitimate public discourse, attire and practice. While Gurna maintains that his fiction does not represent a race, a culture, a place, or a country, he might look kindly on the proposition that his fiction theorizes what we know and how we know it, and how these things are susceptible to the upheavals and reinventions of the historical moment. I want to end this talk uh, with something of a tangential observation, uh, and I apologize in advance if it sounds like a, a grievance and a, and a celebration, because it, it is both. Uh, many of Gurna's novels had fallen out of print in the United States and perhaps elsewhere. I'm thinking of titles like Dottie, Memory of Departure, Pilgrim's Way, and Admiring Silence, to name some. When it was announced that he was going to be the recipient of the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature, Many of these novels resurfaced. These novels have either already been reissued or, 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 excuse me, or are in the process of being reissued. They prominently display the fact that he is a Nobel recipient on their redesigned front jackets, which has caught the attention of many. As a storyteller who, as his longtime British editor, Alexandra Pringle told the New York Times recently, is able to speak of large historical events through small lives, one has to wonder why some of Goethe's fiction has not been given, other, other than in scholarly circles, the attention that they merit. While I am grateful that Goethe has at long last received formal recognition and that this recognition may make his work widely available again, I also cannot help but think that the prize and publishing industries have an outsized role in determining what stories have value and which ones do not have as much value. This very issue was the target of Tariq Ali's remarks on the assemblage that we call world literature in his appearance in the 2013 conference at the London School of Oriental and African Studies. Gurna's fiction is not just about redress. His work sets out to do more than revise and rebut, which is an easy impression to get if one reads the many commentaries about why he was awarded the Nobel Prize. His fiction is also a lyrical celebration of stories and the capacity of stories to carry with them many other stories. Whether it is Utenzi, Islamic parables, campfire anecdotes, or accounts of people like Hassan Ali, who in desertion, mistakes Martin Pierce as a ghost or a jinn. Gurna's fiction speaks to Chinua Achebe's belief that there is no story that is not true. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Well, they knew where to end. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to uh, all other panelists. And um, it's, uh, it's quite a thrill to listen to all of you. Uh,
are speaking to this different, but in my sense, ultimately, I won't say compatible, but uh, co-appearing uh, perspectives, quite uh, quite interesting, which of course um, validates our premise, which is to say that uh, to think in terms of Africa, racial others is something of a of a tautology because what it means is that you know to actually be African is to be all of this. And uh, so I really, really appreciate your quite insightful and generous uh, reflections on this extremely complicated but um, rewarding experiences. So thank you. Um, we always, of course, uh, start off by seeing what our audience are saying in terms of uh, responding to your presentations, either singly or uh, collectively and why that is going on. I will, if you don't mind, try to start by asking a question of all of all three of you so that at least we can uh, uh, get in the mood for that. So if you don't mind turning on your audio, uh, especially video, so we can see you. Thank you. Uh, so I just thought I will ask a question which makes it possible and for all three of you to, to respond in uh, and I hope that, that it's the kind of question that you can respond to. What I meant in the sense of actually sort of relating to your different um, presentations in ways that I'm hoping will, will generate some, some discussion, uh, which is to say that uh, in, in his book, A History of Upper Guinea, 1545 to 1800, that is uh, Walter Rodney, is the book before the book he published before he published the better known or the well known uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa? Something that he said he wrote was based on the archives of uh, Portuguese uh, traders in what is today Sierra Leone and Guinea. <clears throat> and he said that when the Portuguese arrived in that place in the uh, early part of this, in the latter part of the 17th of the 16th century, the the societies that they traded with, that they encountered with, saw exchange in two terms. Exchange, that is whether it's a matter of trade or, uh, or war, but just this uh, encounter, the encounter in two terms. The first is that they land, the Upper Guinea is their own. So there's a sense of national uh, ownership or, or proprietary claim in that, but also that they have to eat. So, uh, and in political terms, I think uh, political scientists and even historians of nationalism in the African context have tended to calibrate this sentiment in terms of the tension between what they call the national struggle, that is the achievement of political independence, whether through anti-colonial struggle or through armed uh, struggle, and social struggle, which is the material attainment of material satisfaction by, by the generality of the population. So obviously the former, that is the national struggle has gained the upper hand because uh, we lived through uh, the age of colonial, anti-colonial, and if you want, well, post-colonial uh, recalibration of experiences. And so, but I'm wondering whether, uh, and in, in, uh, as I listen to you uh, individually, I think you, uh, are not totally oblivious of this idea of the national struggle or nationalism, but I think you, I hear you to be reading against that grain, principally, maybe not exclusively, but principally. Uh, so I wonder whether it's possible to gain any kind of mileage, if you want to respond to this, from actually giving emphasis to exchange, whether it is linguistic in terms of monolingualism or bilingualism, but there's labor in terms of this migration in, from uh, the Indian Ocean towards Southern Africa, uh, or religious in the work fiction of uh, Guruna. So whether it's actually possible to think of these exchanges in terms of people having to eat. I mean, it may seem a very literal, elementary way of putting it, but um, I guess I'm just trying to think, or get us to think in terms of what kind of ideas might we be able to generate if we sort of uh, no, why not fully abandoning this larger question uh, of um, uh, identity in terms of whether it's racial, economic, or, or political, or religious? But in terms of 
uh, daily living, whether it's bare life or whether it's uh, sumptuous life in, in the case of someone like uh, Isabella de Santos. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, I know I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but I'm actually, it's something that I thought would be, uh, might actually get us started. And while you do that, I'm sure there are a couple of questions that our audience can answer. So. Uh, Who wants to go first? Okay. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Radio silent. Um, you now, this is where Memi is interesting for me because if Derrida writes to the past, then Memi writes. Um, to the future, and it's a future that he knows excludes him, which is why he is, you know, quite terrified of that future. He knows there will be no place for him as um, as a Tunisian Jew, and he knows it's on the basis of religion. Uh, and he, so the national struggle, and this is what he writes about in the colonizer and the colonizer. Mm -hmm. He's got to go. Um, and if you want to think about Memi as a kind of precursor to Fanon, Fanon who gave his life in the religious struggle, on the struggle, liberation struggle for Algeria, mm -hmm. has no place in, Algeri in Algerian history. Right? There's not even so much as there's maybe one marker in all of Algeria. And Fanon is excluded because he's not Muslim. Right? So um, the national struggle and the national identity to come for Memi is what tells him you have to leave. And Derrida is much more, I don't know, he's much more lyrical about this because the sounds come to him. But if Derrida were held to account, I think he would have to say without question that Algeria was unlivable for him. Um, and he would have had to go. So there is a and I don't think in Algeria it's about religion for Derrida. I just think it's about the post-colonial state has not been able to accommodate it. And I don't think Derrida was in a position to talk about the war. In fact, he very rarely talks about it. So for him, it's, it's exclusion, which is why I focus on language and monolingualism, because it's the inability to craft that language that can bear this experience. And in Derrida, it's nostalgia. I think in Memi, it's just the sort of brutal pain of being other, uh, or being doubly other, being you know, colonized in a hierarchical way. And then knowing that the Tunisian state to come will exclude him on grounds that are not on ground which he cannot combat. Because he's Jewish. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Ninka or Imad, any um, take that you want to make of this question? Imad, do you want to go first or? Thank you, thank you, Nyanke. Um, <clears throat> Akin, I, uh, I think, I think you, albeit eloquently and cautiously, you, you characterized all of our presentations as reading against the grain of nationalism. Is did I, or did I not hear that correctly? I, I don't want to. That's that's I heard you. Maybe I heard wrongly, but that's what I heard. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, that, that, that's that been something I haven't been able to get past. The um, pointing out sort of parochial ethno-religious nationalisms uh, and violence between um, communities that are not European, uh, pointing that out has often been, th there's, a war, there's a caveat, right, that that might inadvertently become a kind of an apologia, right? Uh, for for colonialism, um, 
and and I think that one one sort of way to address that or to sort of redirect that conversation is the emerging body of scholarship that looks at um, sort of contact zones that that sort of locates Africa or relocates Africa as a part of larger sort of contact zones. The, the body of scholarship that so would loosely fall under this idea of minor transnationalism, right? Uh, so maybe going back further in time and looking at the ways in which um, these communities were always sort of in commerce, culturally, linguistically, economically, in terms of exchange, um, that, that might be a way, and not sort of focusing so much on the modern and contemporary um, narratives, which, uh, which, I, which I, I think, broadly speaking, a lot of post-colonial discourse is focused on. So I think that sort of historical depth might be one way of, um, of thwarting um, the, the counter-characterization that pointing out these um, failures of, of ethno-nationalisms in the post-colonial moment is akin to inv invalidating them. You know, uh, so I would say again, sort of historical uh, a, a sort of a, a deeper historical dive um, might be useful there. I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I answered. No, yeah, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I, I guess that that's what I was sort of suggesting by sort of pointing to the question of the tension between, uh, because in fact, the idea is also that even from the point of view of the masses, so to speak, because that's the terminology that um, the, that the anti-colonial activists used to gain power, that that social struggle dropped off and then became nationalism. And the idea was, the, the, I mean, to put it in, in particular terms, the example of Mami or even Fanon <laughs> sort of dropping out, whereas, you know, whether it is religious, being Muslim, that then predominates in uh, Algeria or political power as such. You know, so that in fact, whatever it was that motivated Fanon to, to, to participate, to be such a central figure in, in Algeria independence, which was like a good life for everyone in that, in the, in that uh, uh, elementary sense, dropped off. I mean, we think of Fanon as a figure being dropping off, dropping off, but in fact, Fanon himself was represented something and that impulse in his work was also what was sidelined when politics became the end of the struggle, whether it's social or national. Does that make sense? So I, I think I, I, I do, I understand what you're, so what you're saying. Uh, Nenka? Yeah, two couple of threads, uh, just okay. sort of probably sort of not quite coherently, but just uh, Ahmad, when you were talking about these earlier histories, I was just, because you also mentioned like uh, Afropolitan authors and there's this great, um, recent edition of like radical history review that was about historicizing the images and politics of the Afropolitan. And I just, you know, cause I, I you know, um, you know, engage with that term in my teaching. And like, that's always what I was trying to get at is that, you know, like the contemporary, like that there's like a deep history to this idea of the Afropolitan and that these like earlier links exchanges mm -hmm. and that the term can be used perhaps more interestingly than it is used um, uh, in a lot of contemporary discourse. Uh, but then just also talking about like this idea, again, when Imad was talking about how like, uh, like post-colonialism foreclosed a lot of narratives, I was just thinking about how my talk, I was interested in how the, uh, how the end of, uh, so like that, that moment of nationalism, when I was talking about like the end of apartheid, how I was talking about how that opened up the possibilities for different kinds of narratives, right? So again, this kind of, you know, South Africa being this sort of weird, like exception to a lot of the way that um, post-colonialism and post-colonial discourse works uh, in the rest of the continent. Um, but also, you know, sort of keeping in mind that even as I sort of identify in the literature, this kind of like opening up um, to different histories, different backgrounds, different stories as um, Gornel would have it. I mean, we, at the same time, we have the horrific uh, sort of xenophobic attacks in South Africa. So not mm. conflating like the, the 
li literary narratives that are happening necessarily with what's happening on the ground. Thank you. Um, there's a question for you uh, from the uh, from the channel. Uh, it says regarding paradise. What do you have to say about the impact of multiple travels on on Yusuf or of Yusuf? How do they impact on his identity and his practice of Islam? Uh, the impact of migration on identity generally. So, if you want to uh, take that, and then we'll hear that. Uh, well, <clears throat> to, to the first to the first part of the question. Thank you to whoever posed the question. Um, actually, I, I do or did address that in in this paper. I I just I cut it out because I had I had one I had one eye on the on the on the clock. Um, I, I think the most consequential of his journeys, Yusuf, is the one he appears to take at the dead end of the novel, where he he, he follows the German column. Right, he looks this way. He looks toward the Germans, and he decides to follow the Germans, and and that, that that's how the that's how the narrative closes. So much can be inferred and extrapolated about that. But but what I what I what I'm arguing is that Yusuf is 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 not a Muslim, and he does not stand in for any kind of doctrinaire or orthodox sense of what Islam means. Uh, he he can barely read Arabic. Um, he doesn't. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't really identify either with the spiritual or with the social rhetoric or values of the people around him, uh, and, and yet he's cast as a kind of a a mirror image for Joseph uh, from Scripture. Um, so you know what I'm what I'm arguing is that actually um, you know he, he's not right. That there's a that there, that there's a general sort of shift in in the place of religion. Uh, in the, in Eastern Africa, and specifically where Islam is is concerned, I'm 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 actually arguing that he, uh, he he's not a Muslim, right, and that his his prospects are more sort of inclining toward a life of exile in the West. Thank you. Interesting, um, Aninka. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, the sociologist you you uh, quoted, I, I, his name is Crony, Jeremy Crony. Jeffrey Cronier. Jeffrey Cronier. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. Good. Anyway, thank you. So I guess I was just uh, quite um, fascinated by what you quoted him as saying, and and then you of course use use uh, his um, argument or or uh, extrapolation to read a, a couple of passages from. Uh, the novel by Singh, Be Be Behold the Earth Months. I, I guess I'm just interested in how different you think the, the contention, you know, the idea of whether these are actually uh, indigenous people or whether they can actually become part of uh, the local people in that uh, cultural or uh, ethnological sense. Where, uh, how different do you think that argument is? Uh, Especially because it sort of sounds in my ears as something at least maybe generally reminiscent of uh, a claim that GM Coetzee makes in white writing, where he characterizes white writing as writing about an experience that is no longer European but has not become um, I may never become African. So, do you think that there's a connection between those two, or is Cronin uh, saying something totally different? I mean, I think Cornier is interesting because he seems utterly incapable of recognizing the sort of irony of his own claims <laughs> that uh, South Asians, that Indians are alien and will remain alien while at the same time making this like strong claim for a Blutenboden kind of like narrative for um, like Afrikaners, right? Like the sense of belonging to the soil. And he just, you know, like, I'm just fascinated by the fact that he can't seem to, like, realize that that those two claims are, are um, you know, like, that that's the same sort of level of, like, non-indigeneity applies to both of these um, population groups, right? Um, 
But uh, so that's why I, you know, I find that part, and, and it only comes out in sort of like reading between the lines of what he's saying, right? Like this fear that like they will be revealed as being also alien. Um, it's not something that he ever explicitly addresses. Um, but I think what uh, Singh's novel, which is written, uh, so Cornea's in 1946, right? So this sort of early apartheid thinking, um, Singh's writing in 1960. I think what her novel stages, uh, at least in my reading, is like the failure of that kind of discourse um, as a means forward for the South African Indian population, right? Like that attempt to stake that same kind of claim to love of the land, because there's all of these passages where they sort of um, like the characters uh, use, as I say, sort of like quite familiar language from settler settler novels about like the the link towards the land, that sense of belonging, um, and that of course is is shown to be precarious, right, and seem to shown to be impossible because they they get moved off the land. Um, but the novel seems to suggest that like that is not the way forward, right? Like that is not the um, not the claim to make. So the two texts are interesting in that they both have this sort of like balance between sentimental language and legal language. Um, like they're both sort of trying to mo make both a sentimental and a legal claim to belonging at the same time. Um, but whereas Pranier remains this kind of like opaque, like, just like non self recognizing, um, uh, you know, sort of ramble. <laughs> um, uh, sings, I think, is more interesting because it, it it recognizes the failure of this kind of claim to the land. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks so much. Um, I have another question for you, uh, uh, Grant. I actually thought maybe that's a question, but it's uh, Emma thanking you for your uh, comment, uh, which is posted in chat. So, the, but the, my question has to do with the uh, with the, with how Derrida prioritizes monolingualism. If you think he does, uh, so uh, at least as we, uh, in monolingualism or the other. Uh, are you are you suggesting that he prioritizes it, it as a that prioritization itself? If you think there is, uh, is it which is a, is it a political choice that is imposed choice in the sense that it lacks the resources that Memi attaches to bilingualism, but without necessarily being denied the prestige that comes from a singular language such as French? Uh, does that make sense? Can you just say the last bit again, please? So I'm saying that, are you suggesting that the reader's prioritization of monolingualism is a, is a political choice in the sense that that choice, that being, being gifted with mono, monolingualism uh, denies him the resources that Mimi attaches to bilingualism, but at the same time, he's not denied the prestige that comes from mm. a singular language such as French. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, um, that's an important distinction. Okay. I would qualify it over by first saying that, you know, I think Derrida would not draw any notion of prestige into question. Um, and he would do so, I think, for one reason. And this is, I think, what monolingualism allows him to do. Monolingualism, I think, is the final stage in a, three-step process, there's the absence of the mother in class, there's circumfession, and then there's monolingualism. And I've argued elsewhere that de monolingualism is Derrida's attempt or maybe even determination to write himself into um, Algeria, or at worst, to write himself as Algerian and not in an uncomplicated sense, but for a man who is so wary of nativity, I think this is Derrida grappling with that. And I think the first step in that actually happens in South Africa in 94, when, you know, he, when he witnesses Hani's death, because he's there, um, that, that explodes. And then he, you know, Spectres of Marx is dedicated to Chris Hani. I mean, I couldn't think of a, a less fitting figure than Chris Hani, you know, because Hani's responsible for, for the death camps and, you know, that precede Carnival. I mean, Ani oversaw that, right? So 
what kind of a Marxist is is um, if he's a Marxist, he's a Marxist of a Stalinist stripe. Um, so you know, but I think that's Derrida's confrontation. Right, he's given a he, he's given an honorary degree at least by my alma mater, the University of the Western Cape, and this is I think a long part of the process for Derrida sort of figures out that I've got to come to terms with, and this is exactly ten years after that other nonsense by. McClintock and Nixon, you know, and they're like where Derrida writes, you know, racism, apartheid racism, the last word, and then they do this nonsense, which is like basically a 500 years of South African history nonsense. Um, so Derrida is, no, seriously, if you read that piece, it's like McClintock and Nixon have no idea what they're talking about. They can't read Derrida. And it was an opportunistic moment where they just figured out, like, this was good, good for their careers. They could take on Derrida. They could make a whole spiel about it. There's nothing substantive about that. There's no reading, no careful thinking by either of them. Um, you know, so, but so Derrida has been grappling with this question for a while. And then I think with monolingualism, he finds a way in, but he doesn't find a way in on his own. He finds a way in through love and Khatibi, right? Khatibi writes, loving two languages. And Derrida says, this is in New Orleans, weird, or maybe it's, it's somewhere in Louisiana. Uh, um, Baton Rouge, I think. And Derrida says, you know, in this room where Khatibi says, I am the most, Af I am the most, you know, like, Maghrebian of us all. Like, what's going on here, right? It's clearly Derrida staging his own struggle with himself. So this has always bothered him. This is the haunting. That's why I think Spectres of Marx is dedicated to Hani, because it's that haunting, right? Like, a spectre is haunting Europe. Derrida works his way through that. However, um, even what you call prestige never sits easily with Derrida. He, he's profoundly troubled by that. And he talks about it in monolingualism. He says, they know I'm from the provinces. I speak too loudly. I dress too brashly, you know? And this is the first time Derrida registers that out of place now, um, that impossibility of place. And I think... You know, my first reading of Nostalgia is that this is, 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 it's that writing. It's Derrida writing himself into, um, you know, into Algeria. And consequently, we can figure Derrida as an African philosopher. We can make the claim that deconstruction is in fact not born in the Sorbonne, but it's born in LBR, right? So I think that's an important claim. But that claim has always struck me as, troubling and I've been haunted by, which is why I come on, come at, uh, I arrive at where I did today, which is to say that monolingualism, what we forget is monolingualism of the other. And Derrida is locating himself here as other. That's the invitation that has not been accepted, certainly not by me. But I think that's what I'm trying to think now. Derrida as other, not only as other to Algeria or other within the halls of the French Academy or the Euro-American Academy, as you please, but Derrida as in fact saying we're all other to language. And so, you know, if you if you come at this from the first from a first reading or just a provisional one, Memi looks like the guy who really sort of gets it, right? Because he writes the colonizer and the colonized. And then Derrida writes this, you know, 40 years later. What's going on here? Hasn't he read Memi? There's no place for Memi in Derrida. Right? They're born literally a few hundred miles from each other on the same coast. He goes to Khatibi. So I'm interested in why Memi is left, left out, why Memi is the absence. But what Memi does is allow Derrida to make the argument against, mono, against bilingualism, right? Is to say what kind of language can bear this love because that's what's excruciating for Memi that he cannot be included in the society that he loves. So it's the mother tongue. It's been, it's been nurtured and nourished by the mother. That's, I think, what, um, what troubles me about, about, about Memi. Not in a, in a bad way, but just it's, it's Memi's ache for this place that won't accept him. Derrida, I think, has come to a different place about that. And he comes to it through language. And so for me, the path is then to say, we're all other to language, right? And I come upon this, fortunately, this you know, um, metaphor by many of 
of the loan. And that's, I think, what allows me to get to implicitly to the gift from Marcel Mauss and Derrida's notion about how the gift breaks the system of exchange. So yes, there's prestige, but as the Americans are wont to say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And um, I think this is Derrida grappling with that. Like what cost did I pay? Okay. And the cost is monolingual. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, no, no. Actually, this is very exciting because uh, there's a question that I see, but I want to, because I mean, the other thing that I wanted to follow up by actually talking about the very notion of gifts. Uh, of what? Relation, of, the gift, of, yeah. of, gift, of the gifts in relation to language. Because I mean, again, because language, even mother tongue is acquired through some kind of what we may call voluntary servitude because we actually learn language. So um, I guess I want to push not necessarily push, but actually uh, engage with that a bit more, that how does acquiring language, um, how does it sound as a gift or something that you borrow as an exchange rather than as something that you actually acquire through an effort through, if you want, I mean, you learn something, you actually expend labor in exchanging, uh, in acquiring it. So uh, I, I guess I, I want you to convince me about, what the status of of the gifts or borrowing has to do with the very acquisition of language, or whether it's okay. something that we can own. Okay. So yeah. when's your birthday? Derrida's is the 15th of July. When is yours? March 6th. Sorry? The 6th March 6th. 6th of oh. March, yes. So it's the 6th of March. And okay. Derrida being a nice guy, because he was very generous. Um, you know, he'd always pay for dinners, that kind of thing. Derrida... Um, gives you a Nigerian football shirt as a gift, right? Okay. So come on the 15th, of, which is also Benjamin's birthday. In yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So come the 15th of July, what do you do? I'll give him something too. Oh, that's the problem. Okay. Why not? The gift is to make up. Mm-hmm. The present is to exchange, right? And yeah. Derrida seeks to break the cycle of exchange. This is what Marcel Mauss, yeah. this is what he learns in mm-hmm. his anthropological research, mm-hmm. that there are communities where you don't reciprocate. And reciprocation does not mean a lack of respect. It simply means that one has given. So yeah. you talk about language as labor, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and it absolutely is, and the acquisition of language as work. I think that's that's valid. But that is not the same as possession. Mm-hmm. To possess yeah. is to take unto the self. And this I would argue is sort of um, you know, where we where we all wax, whether we want to or not, Foucauldian, right? Care of notions of care of the self, which we now celebrate or whatever that is, as influences, etc. Mm-hmm. Right. To take on loan is to accept the gift and it's to, because what Derrida has done with your Nigerian shirt, which has got Arisokan at the back, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. right? he has treasured this, he treasures this, he cares for it, maybe even puts it in a frame, right? Yeah. So there's a tending to, but it's provisional, right? Mm. It, is, it is provisional to take language into our care. It is to hold it, it is to tend it, it is to, and here I think Heidegger is important for Derrida, um, is to, to take that thing, is to make something of it, but never to claim it as my own. It is as, you know, I would mm. argue the distinction between I and mine. Mm-hmm. You talk about children, right? I mean, so, you know, you have kids and we now have a 14 year old who's, you know, massive, but he would say, I am the boss of me. That's like a childlike claim to self-possession. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when, um, you know, when a, a 70 year old orange ogre is talking about himself all the time and what he owns, then you're in trouble. Right? Then you understand what the language of self-possession does if it is not broken. In other words, how do you take that which is given to you and tend to it 
without staking a claim to ownership. In other words, our relationship to language is not only precarious and provisional, but it is a responsibility. And it's a mm. responsibility in an Abrahamic sense, which is to say, Abram, who figures in all three mono, monotheisms, right? What does he do? He is disloyal to his family, um, to his community, to his faith. What does he do? He says to Isaac, we're going to go somewhere and we're going to do this. And then what happens to Isaac? He's going to, he's willing to sacrifice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. That is in, I, um, in any, by any definition, that is irresponsibility, but not irresponsibility as a failure, but irresponsibility as a responsibility to a higher order. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, like he says, I'm going to listen to God and then God rewards him. Right. There's a goat. Now you take that, that's the Hebrew Bible, then in the New Testament, what do we have? Jesus the Christ is sacrificed. Right? Mm -hmm. So God doesn't ask Abram to kill Isaac. But he's like, sorry, you know, and, and, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before, what does Jesus say? You know, like, Lord, let this cup pass me by, and then <laughs> it comes, and what does he say? You know, let not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. So there is, I think, something of that act of supplication about land yeah. that we are in its service that we are responsible to it and irresponsible in the Derridian sense in that we in a Brahmic sense we can do stuff with it that does not seem prescriptive we can be we can be surprised by our own tending to and care of language so yes it's work but it's also an irresponsible kind of work, which means we are free to make of this language a way to live, which is to say a way to love. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, there's much to say to that, but I want to go to a question that will allow uh, both Emma, uh, Emad and Neka to also pitch in. It has to do with ethnicity. We don't know who's asking this question. So, but these are, of course, our members of the audience. Uh, the, the idea is whether ethnicity actually help us to think in, through the questions of becoming African uh, in any of these uh, whether it's uh, from the Maghreb or from the Indian Ocean. Uh, so in other words, it's a very cryptic question, but I think it's also clear uh, that because at least even an Arab or a Jewish person is by, by definition or has an ethnicity. So does that ethnicity follow? Or, I mean, I guess that that's what the... Uh, the questioner is uh, suggesting, and then we can come to the next question. How does ethnicity help us at all in thinking through these questions of becoming African or African identity? Ahmad, Ninka, who wants to go first? We have a couple more, and uh, but we can take these to start with. I'm sorry to jump in, Akin. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Do, does ethnicity help at all in thinking through these True. questions? I, it, it help in, in, in what sense, in relation to what Okay, well, okay. <laughs> I did not ask, yeah. ask, the, ask the question. That's how I understand. I understand it. Okay, let me, perhaps this word has been articulated that because the ethnicity is in uh, inverted commas, as you can see. So the idea is, do we get a better sense of, um, of what it means to become African, right? Or becoming African? from the prism of ethnicity in the sense, it could be in the sense that uh, do, do those people who become African, uh, to, to stay with the examples that we've had, let's say Arabic people or Arab people and all of that, do they stop being that? That's how I understand it, uh, that question. I know it's not, it's, a, it's kind of cryptic, but it seems that where 
uh, that there's a sense in which the there's this an essential but also questioned understanding of ethnicity in 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 that category itself. Okay, well, I mean, if you stand by that, <laughs> we can leave it and move on to another question. Uh, so this is a question, why are US Africanists ignorant of Gruna? British know him, uh, but he lived in England, so what? Uh, okay, I don't understand this question. This is actually not a question. This is a comment, I think, in reference to the final, uh, to, to your closing remarks, a match about uh, Gruna, I thought it was a question. Initial response to the Nobel social media was negative because of Ngrugi, not my question. I can, I can speak to that question with, a, okay. with an anecdote, a personal professional anecdote. I, I remember <clears throat> when, I, uh, when I was finishing my uh, dissertation some 15 years ago uh, and then trying to publish bits and pieces of it, and then thinking of a book project, almost everybody, um, editors, acquisitions editors, cop, everyone um, suggested to me that in order for us to publish this, either as a, you know, even as an article um, or as, as a book monograph, you, 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 need to, you need to cast this writer in relation to writers who are known or better established in the North American Academy. So make sure that if you're talking about uh, Eastern African writers, uh, you know, Gurna, who have Basanji, Nuruddin, Nuruddin Farah, um, although I, you know, that you're also talking about their relationship, how, how are they positioned in, in relation to people like Wole Shoinka, Ngugi, Chinua Achebe. Um, so, um, that, that's not a direct sort of response to this, but it, it sort of speaks to which authors get canonized and enshrined, right? Um, and, and which ones don't. Uh, when I was at the University of Bristol, everybody knew him. Um, uh, his, his fiction appeared on many syllabuses. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a particular reason why Gurna is excluded or, or not known as well uh, on on American syllabuses, as opposed to many other novelists from the Middle East or South America, or <laughs> I, I can't speak I can't speak to those oversights or blind spots. But um, I I think that um, I think that Nienka's project would you know I mean when we think of uh, modernity and sort of racial castes and racial encounters, right? The sort of default frame of reference is, is, the, is, is the Western hemisphere, right? And, and the sort of the Atlantic, those, those circuits of, of relationality and experience and um, Eastern, Central, Southern Africa become less relevant. I don't, I don't know what the right word is, uh, become less relevant to, the sort of racial and political and, and by extension literary imagination in, in North America. I, I really don't know. It's um and I, I hope I didn't sound resentful in my final comments, but I I, I thought it would I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, you know, I mean if you go on Amazon now, you'll see like all these books that you couldn't even find on eBay, you know, they're they're now suddenly being reissued and sold for $19.99 for a paperback. And uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's usually so with no Nobel Prize winners who are not. I mean, the same thing is happening to uh, the French writer. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. some of our works were not even translated <laughs> until relatively recently. So, uh, but people, what people often say about Nobel Prize is that it at least allows people to be aware of a writer who, for a long time, had not got, especially in terms of book buying, maybe not so much in terms of. Uh, been included in academic uh, discourses, but in terms of actually their work being known, they are better known after that. And perhaps that's uh, something that in, in general context could be applicable to Guruna, as to uh, uh, Leclésio 
or anyone who is not um, uh, who is not like uh, who a real standard American writer like Updike or, or uh, you know, so I think that for that reason, yeah, maybe because of course an African writer, there's always this uh, this need to compensate in, in a sense, and that may be partly why he's seen that way. But I wanted to hear from Ninka about this question because there's some there's a very interesting equation you developed between Lego. Uh, I forgot the other. Uh, part of the question. You were trying to sort of contrast the uh, Western hemispheric understanding of relationship between the continent on, and the ocean to the Eastern thing. And I actually wanted you to speak a bit more to that because it's a very, very fascinating analogy that you were trying to develop or, or critique. Uh, so uh, you, you said something in legal terms. Uh, I'm not remembering it, but I was taking notes, so I didn't, I didn't quite uh, catch the word when you were reading. So could you say something about that? Maybe has a relationship to the comment that Emma just made? Oh, yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, when Emma was talking, I was like, yeah, this kind of sounds like a West Africa versus East Africa <laughs> divide in being known. But then of course, Ngugi would be the exception, right? And I think uh, the questioner points out that a lot of the reactions were like that it was Ngugi's turn to get the um, the Nobel Prize, right? And he was, you know, so, you know, the fellow uh, more well-known East African author. Um, but yeah, I, I have uh, thinking, yeah, about this distinction, just sort of the prominence of um, the Atlantic in understandings of slavery and enslavement, um, specifically, uh, I guess, sort of in, uh, in America. Um, so what I'm interested in in looking at the Indian Ocean is uh, what I was talking about the, the legal forms is that the kind of legal records you have from uh, Indian Ocean colonies, uh, which tended to be Dutch and French, um, are very different than the ones you have from the Anglophone Black Atlantic um, in terms of the the uh, the enslaved people could testify in the same courts um, and their words were recorded. They could act as witnesses. They could act as, um, uh, they could uh, speak in their own defense. And all of these uh, sort of uh, speeches were recorded, right? And so they, they exist in the archives. Whereas I think the, the, the way that the uh, like Anglophone Black Atlantic is imagined is the space of just um, absolute silence and erasure. Like languages are erased, um, and names are erased, uh, like histories are erased, right? Because of the way, in many ways, it's for the simple reason that like the British had separate slave courts um, and those records were are pretty much entirely lost, they weren't recorded. Um, the ones that do persist are sort of accidentally like recorded in newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, so, but on the other hand, in the Black Atlantic, you have this rich tradition of uh, autobiography, right? Enslaved autobiography um, from, um, uh, well, various sort of authors, uh, which is, uh, absent in the Indian Ocean. There's uh, no sort of famous enslaved autobiography from the Indian Ocean. And even the, the sort of autobiographical fragments that we have are, are not that kind of like self-narrative, like I so-and-so am writing this narrative about my life. Um, so the distinction that I have is, uh, League, the, Atlantic, the Black Atlantic, the Anglophone Black, Black Atlantic is a space of um, autobiogra autobiographical speech, but legal silence, whereas the opposite is true of the Indian Ocean, right? And what I'm trying to track is also uh, how that affects the kind of literature that uh, emerges out of, um, out of these two different worlds. And so with uh, Christiansa, what I'm interested in is, is, and all of these authors is how they're engaging with these legal records um, and how they're deploying these sort of ample voices that exist, um, how, you, how you work with that, um, taking into account the fact that this is a sort of imperial archive um, how do you deal with the sort of power dynamics? Like how much can you take from those archives? Um, how, uh, uh, to what extent can you 
imagine the enslaved as actually speaking from these archives or whether it's just sort of a speech effect. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, the, the distinction that I was making there between. And I think just the, the, the way that we imagine enslavement is so dominated by the Anglophone Black Atlantic that entering, and, and of course we have these great records um, from uh, the Atlantic in the Dutch and French and Spanish uh, legal records as well, but they're just not as well known. Thank you. Um, we, we have a question that I believe, oh, actually, yes. Oh, okay. It's actually something uh, in response to your comment, uh, Grant, regarding Chris Haney as uh, the manager of uh, Death Camp. And I think it's something to actually address. <laughs> However, how much time we have left, but I actually want you to speak to that because the question is saying that apart from his... Uh, from Stalinist as a, uh, excuse me, from Hani as a Stalinist communist. Could you say more about the death camps? I mean, we, we know this in a sense, but I, do, I think you raised the sense of what's there to celebrate by uh, Derrida in a guy such as Hani. Uh, but uh, so yeah, in other words, could you, say, could you say more about those uh, sure. death camps so that these people will be better informed? Yeah, when Professor Bull was speaking about, you know, how after, for me, it's 90, it's never 94. I think 94 is just when sort of stuff happens. Um, but after 90, when she, when she suggested narratives opened up, I think it's almost exactly the opposite. I think stuff shuts down in such uh, a hegemonic way. I mean, let me put it this way, in relation to John could see, um, the apartheid regime couldn't drive him out, but after disgrace, you know, John leaves, yeah. He goes to he goes to Adelaide. Australia, right? yeah. You know, part of that is because John wants to cycle in a good city, and, and Adelaide's perfect for cycling. Um, but I think it's it's also you know the completely unthinking ANC response to disgrace, right? So it's the shutting down of narratives. Um, look, I I'm an anti ANC person of good standing. You know, like, they're an absolute disaster. I think Professor Boo has pointed out uh, the xenophobia because, you know, Black South Africans, particularly of a certain dispensation, are, they're welcoming of white Europeans, but anybody from, who's from the North and is Black and is African, as a Nigerian professor, Arisokan, you, you must be familiar with this. Yeah. Right? Yep. yeah. I mean, I've been attacked too, <laughs> no, I wasn't set ablaze, I was lucky. <laughs> But, but yeah, exactly. it's, 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 so, it's common in South Africa, yeah. Right, I mean, this, the, I mean, I feel the same way about Chris Hani as I do about River Phoenix, right? Dying was a good career move. Um, you know, that's a cynical thing to say. But what happens with that is Hani is martyred and the questions are never asked about what happened in those camps. Hani is suppression. And we have an equivalent in South Africa with Stompy Moketsi, you know, when this kid is killed by the Mandela Football Club. Right? So I'm not going to say anything that is not dripping with bitterness and vitriol in relation to this, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, the African National Congress is responsible for the death of my community. And I mean that. Right? This violence that they practice, that they have mastered in the province of KwaZulu Natal, as I'm sure Professor Bull knows, is horrific. Their violence against the people who are trying to claim land. So Chris is just symptomatic, you know. Um, he's not he's not exceptional. He's no different from Winnie Mandela. Uh, I will say that you know Nelson Mandela, Thabo Mbeki, Govan, um, you know, there there's a generation of of older ANC leaders who I don't think would have countenanced this. But I think Hani belongs to that class. It's the same. I mean, Chris Hani and, and Sir Ramaphosa, they're birds of a feather, right? I mean, one goes to John Ake and the other one's looking for a different kind of power. It's just symptomatic of the failure of the South African promise, I suppose. But it was never, I mean, if you speak to anybody who was not 
a populist, a black nationalist, petty bourgeois populist, people who were trained as I was, as a high school student, we could have told you this was coming. We knew this was coming. In fact, I wrote this, I published this in 1992. I said, this is what's coming. Not a surprise. The African National Congress is a petty bourgeois black nationalist organization. Nelson Mandela is a member of a royal house. I accuse Nelson Mandela of the death of my community. I mean, it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would rather not talk about this because I'm, you know, I'm a, I, I started high school in 1976. I was there for Soweto. I finished high school in 1980 when there was another eruption just literally down the road from where I live. You know, my generation is responsible for the resuscitation of the African National Congress. We are as such complicit in what has followed. So the death camps, there were many of them. The African National Congress, Mkonto was Sizwe, and you talk to the generals, will tell you they were, they were utterly inefficient, they were poorly trained, and, you know, they've all, they've all managed to convert that into something like capital. I mean, this is the great success of the African National Congress, mm -hmm. the embourgeoisment of that Mandela class. Yeah. Which Ani then... Was Ani, Ani was a cruder face of that, but he was of a piece. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. So which actually, in fact, again, maybe the question wasn't very clear, I admit, but the question of ethnicity actually makes sense in relation to this, because when you speak, you speak about this being your community. So there's also a sense of belonging there, and that can be read in general terms in terms of ethnicity, which is to say, uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm actually saying that if in that case, to uh, to speak or to speak against the grain of nationalism in this regard is also problematic, I would say, because ultimately now you're speaking about ANC as, and you know, it's a sentiment I share, which is to say that if you identify ANC as being responsible for the destruction of your community, you are claiming a sense of, of belonging to that community, which is leg perfectly legitimate. So to that extent, what, what purchase is there for nationalism? And I get that that's what the person who has the question about ethnicity, ethnicity is the term that is used here. Um, perhaps it can be explained or at least maybe expanded to include something like nationalism or the sense of community because, uh, I mean, you, you, whether it's Kuruna, whether it's uh, Singh or whether it's Abad Mami, these are Africans who feel excluded. And if, and they do so on the basis of how they are characterized by the dominant group in South, maybe the Arabs in uh, in Algeria, or the French, if the case may be the, the in 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 in, uh, in Tanzania or in Zanzibar by those who who revolted against Arabs in you know in 1964, 1965. So I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that if in that case, uh, why why um, why undermine, why speak against the grain of nationalism in the sense in which you've done? So in other words, if ANC is guilty of all of this, the ground on which we respond to it is also national, even if we don't put it as such. Does that make sense? I mean, I know we are running out of time, but I think that this is actually a very, these are actually interesting points to, uh, to take up. I could speak to it, but I think I'm going to allow my fellow panelists to have at it. You know, I've said, I think I've said plenty, but I'm happy to come in at the end. Um, I mean, tricky. <laughs> um, uh, just thinking, just based on your sort of, uh, um a response i just it was just occurred to me like how hard it is to get away from nationalism even when we're as you say sort of speaking against again attempting to speak against the grain or perhaps you know i think mine was 
perhaps attempting to speak against the grain of sort of a like racialized identities, right? Rather than nationalism. But the point is like, even as I'm trying to do this Indian Ocean reading, I'm still focusing on South African literature, right? And then sort of my, my bigger interests like definitely go beyond that. Um, and I didn't have a chance to speak to some of the other texts that I'm interested in and examine here because it just seemed in order to like have a coherent argument, it made sense to focus on a specific like nation state, right? So I think perhaps what you're pointing to is that even when one tries to escape these uh, categories, they end up sort of being reinforced in some way. Um, so I, not really a, a answer to the ethnicity question, but perhaps more like the importance of nationalism and uh, the, our inability to sort of get away from it entirely, right? Um, how whatever we're doing is in dialogue with like nation states, like the nation state as a as a formation, even when that doesn't make, and everyone admits that that doesn't make sense, um, well, anywhere, but in Africa specifically, because these are sort of like colonial borders. Like, again, if you think about the question of ethnicity, like the nation state does not map onto ethnicities, right? Um, but yeah, so interesting observation that we're Yeah, I guess that what I'm saying, that. I mean, I guess what I'm saying, I mean, I'm sorry if I interrupted you, but I guess what I'm saying is that when Grant, identifies his community as victims of ANC. That sense of community, I think of it as national, as a national identity. It may not be, it doesn't have to be equated or equatable to a nation state, but that sense of community could be ethnic, could be religious, could be linguistic. And I think that that's legitimate. So uh, I'm not then suggesting that, um, that that is equivalent to a particular nation or maybe South Africa because actually transnational in that sense, okay? But that sense of belonging to a particular group, whether it's a religious group, whether it, I think that that's really very important. And I guess that what I'm saying is that why exclude nationalism? Why understand that kind of identity in other ways than national? That's what I'm I, I, sort of get, getting at. And I'm asking a question, I'm not uh, making an assertion of it. Um, Emma, do you wanna go take this? Actually, <clears throat> The, the illustrative example I'm going to use is not really all that relevant to the conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead, Grant. <laughs> you know, I think you, um, you're you absolutely right. The first side is open. I mean, it is, it is a community, but it's not in any way national. I think Professor Boor, I'm not sure where she's from, but I'm guessing she's from, she's from Johannesburg or maybe Pretoria, but you know, I'm thinking she's not, she's not a Cape Townian. Am I wrong? It's complicated. Okay, well, you know. Um, I've spent more time in Cape Town than in any other South African city. Um, I, I grew up mostly in Namibia, honestly. <laughs> okay, well, that's it. So I'm a, you know, I'm from Cape Town, but I'm not a Cape Townian in that sense. I'm not, I went, when I say my community, I mean a very, I mean, maybe a hundred thousand people in the township on the Cape Flats where I grew up called Hanover Park. That's it. And it's not even a hundred thousand people. It's quite frankly, maybe 30 guys I played football with. That's it. Like I've written about this in, you know, Entre New. I talk about, you know, being in between. So, that's that's the one response. I mean, I do not, and I've written again about this elsewhere. I'm I do not consider myself a national citizen either of the country I was born or the country whose passport I travel on. So, you know, I think nationalism is the first refuge of scoundrels, and you know, patriotism is where you know is where violence goes to breed. So, there's that. The but I will try and address this complication by offering this term. Um, and I have written about this, you know, just finished the manuscript like a week, literally a week ago um, about 
my apartheid education. And I offer this notion, the diaspora in place. Let me define that and I'll do so in a minute. Um, I left South Africa before I ever got on the plane. The diaspora in place. It is to imagine a world beyond while being physically still rooted in. So that's why the national community, I think psychically it has a hold on me as I imagine it does on all of us. But as a mode of thinking, I think I've always resisted it. I want no part of it. Um, and so this notion of the diaspora in place to be, to be, or to have left before you already gone. That I think is what has enabled me to, enabled me to survive apartheid South Africa. And, you know, I think for me, the great disappointment about this topic of conversation is that Derrida and Memi are lost, you know? Um, I feel a little like um, Michael Corleone in, uh, in, you know, The Godfather part two or three where he says, the more I try to get out, the more they pull me back in. So, you know, I mean, like, I, I'd rather talk about Derrida and Nemi, but as Mark says, you know, we make history under conditions not of our own choosing. Thank you. Emma, we can take your comments, however uh, controversial or, <laughs> or tangential you think it is, please. And then we can wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> Mienke, did, did you want to, did you want to say anything? I'm good. Um, I mean, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I, I, I think something that Nienka said actually triggered a thought. I, I, I think that conflating the nation state with nationalism or nation is a mistake. Um, I think if you look through the historiography, the nation state has often reigned in nationalisms. Um, <laughs> Uh, having said that, I, I think it's really difficult to ignore. I, th I think it's very difficult to ignore that um, nationalism and patriotism. I mean, people who characterize themselves as the latter will fight you tooth and nail that patriotism is different than nationalism. It's less toxic. It's less vehement. I, I'm not so sure, having lived in this country uh, post-Trump, um, post 9-11, actually, and the election of a a black man with a Muslim name as president. Um, I, I, I think that nationalism and racism uh, have very cleanly aligned, at least in this country, to the point where I would say that nationalism is is a euphemism for racism. It's just it's just a distraction, um, which might sound like I'm saying there is something salvageable about the nation state, right? If you're <laughs> If you're if you're if you're if you're pledging ideals to a to a to a to a spatial community with certain values, certain commitments, certain you know selfless service to you know maybe maybe that's something, maybe that's and and that's very similar to what Fanon was arguing in the Wretched of the Earth, right? Uh, when he was trying to sort out sort of ethnic and racial and historical nostalgia from service to the moment. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's really what I was going to say. But again, I mean, the North American example might not be all that useful to, you know, sort of shedding light on the current conversation about the ANC in South Africa. But the distinction between national, you know, national or the nation and the nation state are very crucial here, I think. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you. We can go on and on. These are extremely interesting topics and uh, extremely relevant also and um, ones that we are very passionate about, uh, both in, in terms of identity, individual uh, political, but also in terms of professional engagement. And so I really appreciate your generosity, your attentiveness and your uh, your openness to, to questions about all this and uh, quite, uh, quite helpful to have this mix. And as a matter of fact, this was the initial trigger for this because uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that it's somewhere on the internet. The um, the presidential address of Gora Bitsai. I will actually recommend it if you guys haven't read it. It's really very 
passionate and extremely interesting too. Uh, so since I, I heard that speech, I've been quite interested in developing this topic and with, with his uh, guidance, I'm quite uh, grateful that we're able to get it done. I wanted to thank all three of you again for your time and again, your graciousness. I really, really want to underscore that because you, you have other things to do. You uh, are very busy, uh, but you, you've you taken time off, not just today, but in the last one month, maybe a month and a half <laughs> to actually put these, uh, uh, to bump this up in your schedule. So thank you very much for this. And um, I hope we can call on your, uh, on your generosity and graciousness again. I no. appreciate your time. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Uh, that So you are taking your gift back. <laughs> All right. We already acknowledge it. And uh, yeah. we want to thank you for it. Seriously, on behalf of the association, please accept our sincere gratitude for your time. And um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your time. Morocco won which is, I think, uh, good for some people's uh, um, uh, psychology or whatever I want to call it, uh, in a sense. I mean, we don't think that uh, that's the uh, be on and end all of anything, but it's, it's good. And I think for national and other political or transnational African solidarity or black solidarity across the world, well, at least we can celebrate that. Uh, but I wanted to actually thank you honestly for this. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed the rest of your uh, weekend. Uh, it's midnight to you, Nenka, uh, but thank you so much for, for your time. And thank you, Grant, and thank you, Ahmad, for uh, giving us your time. And uh, have a good afternoon or evening or morning. Thank you. <laughs> Happy holidays. Thank yeah, you. Be safe, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Yeah, Take bye. Care. Take care. Bye-bye.